weekly sci-fi segment. Sci-fi segment. Welcome to the Sci-Fi Show on Game Shout. Hey, welcome back to Game Shout Radio. This is Science Thursday with your host, Mad Doc Solrift, and my fizzy host, co-host, Jadri. Yes, we've been doing a lot of fantastic science experiments here in the studio. Of course, we'll bring you science in the studio in the second half of our show. In the first half, we've got some very interesting science news, such as the secret of blowing square bubbles has been discovered. Ooh, 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 ooh. I know a girl who can do that. (laughs) But, But let's not go there. Okay, well, look. Here's the biggest problem. Bubbles are, are traditionally spherical because the shape contains the maximum volume of air with the minimum surface area of, say, solvent and water. Now, for the same reason, for example, like when you take two bubbles and you stick them together, that sort of double bubble, well, it, it forms, uh, a, it usually sticks together and, and forms a single larger bubble because, again, it, uh, it can cut the surface area down by about 20%, so you get a, a bigger bubble. But now, some scientists, you know, I guess they just have nothing better to do, but they are searching for a way to make square bubbles. Now, when the surfaces of these original bubbles are studded with polystyrene or zirconium beads around three micrometers across, something strange happens. Now, they found out that by combining, that instead of combining together into a big bubble, multiple bead studied bead studded bubbles remain stable because of the surface forces exerted when the beads are crammed together. Now by prodding the merged bubbles with microfluidic pipettes, the team has created square, saddle, and even tubular shaped bubbles. The largest bubble created so far is two centimeters in diameter, but the work could theoretically extend to much larger bubbles. Tubular dude! (laughs) <laughs> Tubular bubbles. <laughs> oh gosh, that's that's funny. So, I, w- uh, I want to see him create a little, uh, you know, like a, uh, a balloon poodle out of a bubble. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking the same thing. Yeah, yeah. What well, a blast. all those little polystyrene pellets or whatever. But uh, who would have thought? Now, I never tried putting three micrometer yeah. pellets on my bubbles. <laughs> yeah, who thunk it? Who would have thunk it? Well, you know, we've always been uh, following the these human stem cell research in order to uh, cure diseases, and one of the biggest fears is that if we ever do any experiments and tests with human stem cells on animals, we might create some sort of bizarre human-animal hybrid, like an intelligent mouse or something. But uh, you can now rest assured, because a recent test where human embryonic stem cells were injected into the brains of two-week-old mouse fetuses developed and functioned like normal mouse cells. Oh! In fact, you know, they they were not rejected by the mouse's immune system, and they even grew to the same size as the mouse cells. Now, you see, a human brain cell is normally about 17 micrometers across, and uh, the mouse brain cells are only about 11 micrometers across. So these human stem cells, when injected into the mice, they, you know, they shrunk down and, and they really fit right in. So, well, you know, this finding that, that human uh, embryonic stem cells can fit in so well with their new home is encouraging news for researchers hoping to use them to treat neurological diseases. And, you know, it also, you know, it just gets rid of that ethical concern about creating animals with part human brains when these therapies are tested. Um, they were actually really thunderstruck by the fact that these immature human cells were able to respond to cues from the mouse and become more mouse-like. They actually operated like normal mouse brain cells, you know, incorporated right into the mouse brain to, uh, to fit in and, and work like a mouse brain cell. How, however, only about a couple hundred of the hundred thousand cells that were injected into each mouse survived. So less than 0.1% of the mouse's brain became uh, part of human embryonic stem cells. But it's still pretty interesting to think about. So, 
it, it kind of uh, reduces the chance of creating intelligent mice, but it does give us a lot more open-ended possibilities for doing embryonic stem cell research and hopefully discovering stem cell cures in the, uh, in the future. Yes, indeed. Well, uh, on the topic of sticking stuff into brains, how about a study like this? Um, women do, in fact, get more of a buzz out of cartoons than men do. I don't know For if you guys have been watching your cartoons, but women and men are often perceived as having differences in their senses of humor, but until now there has been no neurological evidence for such suspicions. Now the new brain scanning study showed that although men and women tended to agree on which of the cartoons they were shown were funny, they processed the humor differently in their brains. Now in particular, women appeared to have lower expectations that the cartoon would be funny than men. Women appeared to have less expectation of a reward, which in this case was the punchline of the cartoon. So when they got the joke's punchline, they were more pleased about it, said Alan Rice, one of the study's authors, which was conducted at the University, uh, the Stanford University of School of Medicine in California. So it was a small study conducted with uh, 10 women and 10 men, and they were shown a series of black and white, uh, you know, still panel cartoons. They rated the cartoons for, for funniness and for, well, fi sorry, they rated the cartoons for funniness while functional magnetic resonance imaging, or fMRI, identified the active areas of their brain. The level of activity in those areas was measured using a technique that analyzes the level of oxygenation to the blood. So it's a pretty typical U test, but just a, a different set of studies. Now, see, they found that the men and the women shared many similarities. They f mostly found the same cartoons funny or unfunny. They activated the same semantic and language processing regions of the brain. And the response times for finding the cartoon funny was the same. But they were surprised to find the difference in the part of the brain known as the reward center. The nucleus accumbens, part of the mesolimbic reward center, is a dopamine-rich area that is most strongly activated when a reward, in this case a funny joke, is unexpected. So the team discovered that when women found a cartoon funny, their reward center was more active than for men, suggesting that the female's expectations for being amused was lower. But when men found a cartoon unfunny, they showed a deactivation in their reward center, suggesting disappointment. So there you have it. <laughs> women That's why are, women are more easily amused. That's why women always laugh at my jokes. Thank you, ladies. <laughs> oh, that's why I've got to force the chuckles out. Shut well, up, Sol as Rift. it happens. <laughs> as it happens, meditation. <laughs> meditation does do more than just make you feel good and calm you down. It makes you perform home, better. Home, and, oh yes, it alters the home. structure of your brain. <laughs> Sorry, I'm meditating. Home. Meditating very noisily in your little <laughs> corner there. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's home. making it hard for the rest of us to meditate. <laughs> well, people who meditate say that the practice restores their energy and, and some claim they need less sleep as a result. And many studies have reported that the brain works differently during meditation. Brainwave patterns change and the neuronal firing patterns synchronize. But whether meditation actually brings any of the restorative benefits of sleep has remained largely unexplored. So, Bruce O'Hara and colleagues at the University of Kentucky in Lexington decided to investigate. They used a well-established psychomotor vigilance task, which has long been used to qualify the effects of sleeplessness on mental acuity. The test involves staring at an LCD screen and pressing a button as soon as an image pops up. Typically, people take 200 to 300 milliseconds to respond, but the sleep-deprived people take much longer and sometimes miss the stimulus altogether. Now, 10 volunteers were tested before and after 40 minutes of either sleep, meditation, reading, or light conversation, with all subjects trying all conditions. 
Now the 40 minute nap is known to improve performance after an hour or so hour or so to recover from the grogginess. But what astonished researchers was that meditation was the only intervention that immediately led to superior performance, despite none of the volunteers being experienced in meditation. So it's like, it's incredible. Every single subject that volunteered, you know, they showed improvement. And uh, why it improves, why it improves the, uh, the brain function, they, they don't quite know that yet. They're going to keep studying um, probably experienced meditators who spend several hours each day in the practice and hopefully come to an understanding. But in the meanwhile, those of us out here might want to give meditation a try before jumping into that exciting game of Battlefield 2 and prove our response time. Um, um, I'm going to kick your butt. Um. <laughs> yes, you got to get the brainwaves synchronized so you can... Click faster. Ooh, headshot. <laughs> well, you know. Hey, you know, I went in for an I, I went in for an eye test where you have to do reaction timing, and and you have to um, click on certain buttons to to match the areas. And and he the the guy looks at me and he says, "You're a gamer, aren't you?" I said, "Well, yeah. Why?" He says, "I only see the fast times like that in gamers." <laughs> <laughs> the eye-hand coordination. Well, you know, there are other means of identifying gamers, especially if you're an excessive computer gamer, which really brings us to tonight's main no way. science topic. Really? Yes. Excessive computer gaming has all the hallmarks of addiction, suggests a new experiment on drug memory. The researchers argue that it should be classified as such, enabling addicts to start seeking help. What do you think oh, I'm of that? Be sh I'm shooting up a Pentium chip right now. <laughs> Give me a break. Well, you know, here's the thing. Learning is recognized as an important underlying mechanism of addiction. In becoming addicted, people start to associate cues that are normally neutral with the object of their craving. To a crack addict, for instance, a building in which they have used the drug is more than just a place they have been, it becomes a trigger for a craving and can, on its own, reignite a need to use the drug again after months of abstinence. Now, these, these studies were, were, um, were done in uh, the University of Medicine in Berlin, Germany, so it's not a, a U.S. study, but they wanted to see if computer game cues would also trigger the same sort of drug memories in excessive computer gamers. Now, they compared 15 men in their 20s who admitted that gaming had chased other activities, such as work and socializing, out of their lives, and 15 game-playing but otherwise healthy controls. Now, they showed them a variety of visual cues and asked the volunteers to rate how they felt about those images. All had normal reactions to neutral images, such as chairs, and even alcohol-related images, despite the fact that all participants drank alcohol. I guess none were addicted to it. But excessive computer game players showed classic signs of craving when they were presented with freeze frames from some of their favorite games. They desperately wanted to play, expected to feel better once they did, and fully intended to indulge again as soon as possible. Ah. I gotta have my fix, man. I gotta play some BF2. Oh, 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 oh man. Now see, in another test, they didn't stop there. The researchers monitored the response of a large muscle in the eye to see how much the volunteers could be startled when looking at a game-related image. Now, see, scientists theorize that the most pleasing stimuli prompts the smallest of startful reflexes. They found that excessive game players could not easily be startled, unlike the controls. Now, the scientists say that addictions stem from relying too heavily on one coping strategy, which eventually becomes the only activity that can activate the dopamine system and bring a person relief. It's the same mechanism in all addicts. Now, another another uh, another researcher who founded the computer addiction service at McLean Hospital in Boston, the Boston, agrees that the condition has a lot in common with other addictions. Now, see, what makes it tough is that gamers cannot 
simply abstain from using computers. They are now an integral part of our lives. In that sense, it has to be approached the same way as an eating disorder, as the scientists suggest. Now, see, computer games have, have also have this reinforcing quality. So a lot of uh, other researchers think that the comparison to, for example, drug abuse, uh, drug abuse, um, isn't is not a bad comparison to make. So uh, a lot of people are agreeing that computer games have the addictive potential of drugs or even gambling. And there are groups such as the Online Gamers Anonymous and even EverQuest Windows, and they're overflowing with stories of people so wrapped up in slaying monsters for days that they neglect to eat, wash, or sleep. <gasps> oh, the horror. I don't know, have any of you guys ever experienced gaming addiction? Or, yeah, or are you just not willing to admit it? <laughs> DDR well, is like the yeah, most addictive game ever. Uh, World of Warcraft. Uh, I think my son and his wife are addicted to it. Oh, I can I can understand that. I can too. Oh yeah, same here. Yeah, See? World of Warcraft. Uh... Yeah, WoW crack. But still, World it, it's, of Warcraft. Uh, I I don't think World of Warcraft has affected me quite as much as uh, Dark Age of Camelot did when I dropped out of school and essentially did nothing for all of a year just to play that one game. <laughs> yeah. Silence. Yeah. They're in shock. Ah, oh, what are they yeah, doing? Yeah, we're worried about you, man. Well, I can't. I sold my my Daoke account. I admit it. That's that's how I broke the addiction. I knew there was a problem. I sold my account, and I actually made a nice tidy profit on it. So it wasn't such a bad thing after all. Oh, really? Yeah. You, how much? Uh, I got about five hundred US on my uh, my character. Wow, five hundred bucks. Whoa! Yeah. yeah. So, well, I I wouldn't recommend it as a uh, as as a job per se because you know five hundred dollars a year, considering that maybe three hundred of that was paid in monthly fees to actually get the game and pay for internet access. Well, it's not exactly yeah, a way of making money. No, but you still you made still a money on that deal. You'd be surprised. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that that was well. I was also I think I had the the richest character by a factor of 14 on, on my server when I quit. Most people had maybe one or wow. two plat, I had 28. <laughs> That's what I did, I just sat around, got money all day. I, I'd finished all the other quests. But You're a that, greedy that goes bastard. To show, that goes to show how addictions can get you hooked up in some ways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah.
uh, we just found some modeling clay that was in a drawer somewhere, and basically a pen cap. Okay. And then we filled up the soda bottle with water, took the pen cap and put on the uh, point down where it f uh, fits over your uh, pocket. We put a big ball of clay on that and just kind of dropped it into the into the bottle, not letting the air get out of the top of the pen cap. Then, okay, okay, um, I got it. You put the lid on, and what it is is the uh, pen cap will just start bobbing right up at the top, but when you squeeze the bottle, the pressure increases, uh, pushing water up into it, making uh, the air shrink under pressure, so you're, you'll actually sink the pen cap. It'll actually slide down in the bottle. And uh, when you let go of squeezing, it rises back up. You know, those things are a lot of fun to play with. Oh, yeah. Experiments. Experiments with gas. Well, you know, it, it's not just the gas. It's the, it's the gas pressure. And uh, when, when you're squeezing the bottle and you're increasing the pressure, the air pressure pushes down. The, the air pressure within the bottle cap you know, not with the bottle cap, but within the, the pen cap stays the same, but the, bo the air that's pressure right. at the top of the bottle goes up, and that's what causes it to sink. I just ask you, do me one favor. Don't equalize your pressure here, okay? Thank you. <laughs> I am not going anywhere near that one. <laughs> no escaping so gas in here. So off the radar. <laughs> well, Maverick... Well, when we do have taco night, you're you're known to do that relatively often, so I wouldn't be talking too much. But on the topic no, of gas, no, boy, me. this this reminds me of a really good science experiment that unfortunately we we, uh, we couldn't reproduce in the studio due to fire hazards. But I did do this in a, a high school science class, and it was so much fun. I've got to relay you this story. We were doing a, a science experiment on incomplete combustion. Um, we, we were using a, a type of, of heavy flammable gas, acetylene, which is used in acetylene torches. And essentially we'd fill a beaker with this gas and then pull off the lid and immediately put a match on it. And what would happen is you'd get this huge explosion of ash just poof right out everywhere because there was, wasn't enough oxygen in the air just above the, uh, the uh, jar to burn all of the acetylene that was filling the jar. So. This is the science teacher's like, okay, this is an example of incomplete combustion. Now let's see what happens when we put half acetylene gas and half air into the jar in order to, you know, provide enough air to properly burn the acetylene and, and give it a complete combustion reaction. So then he, of course, he pulls off the lid, pulls up, puts up a match, and then foosh, ash goes everywhere again. So while he's sitting there wondering, oh, wow, I guess this didn't quite work out the way I expected to, I was scribbling on my notebook and... and you know, doing the molar ratios for the chemical formula for the combustion of acetylene gas. And I pointed out that considering that there's only about 21% oxygen in air, and you need an 8 to 1 molar ratio of oxygen to acetylene gas to have complete combustion, that you wouldn't, you, he wasn't giving enough oxygen to actually burn the amount of acetylene that went in. But I pointed out if you filled it half and half with acetylene gas and pure oxygen, then you would have enough. Um, oxygen to have a complete reaction. Can you see where this one's going? Uh-oh. Boom. <laughs> Boom. He Sure enough, he takes the pure oxygen out of the tank. He's like, wow, you did the ratios. You did the formulas. We've got to try this out now. Fills it up. Half acetylene, half pure oxygen. Stands back. Puts the match. Bang! There is just no jar left on the desk. <laughs> oh, man! <laughs> Just Glass bang, it's right. exploded. Sure enough, you know, the whole school comes running around trying to figure out what's blown up in the chem lab. But uh, thankfully no one was harmed. We never found any shards of the, uh, of the, the glass beaker. It must have been completely vaporized. Um, we oh, my! The beaker that due to cutbacks, the beaker was swapped with an empty, um, empty jar, a jam jar from the kitchen, which is why it couldn't withstand the force of the explosion. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah, usually uh, those too good. beakers, usually the beakers that they use for science, those are uh, a special type of tempered glass, isn't it? 
Yeah, normally they, they would be able to withstand an explosion of such force, especially because it's, it's an open topped beaker, so most of the gas from the explosion can go up. It's not stuck inside the glass, but uh, I, I got the mo moral or I got the ratios just so right that the, the force of the explosion just shattered the glass. So that's that's the trick. When you're when you're creating an explosive, make sure you use a source of pure oxygen. But uh, we don't oh, want yeah. you creating Boom. explosions in your home. Uh, we do want you to find some fun experiments. And sure enough, we we announced an experiment that we wanted everyone to try out and send in their reply to uh, about magic mud. And we did get a reply, so we're going to send out a T-shirt to uh, to Bruce from Illinois. And uh, Bruce correctly identified magic mud as the uh, the substance that you you get when you mix cornstarch and water. And what makes it so cool is that when you try to act really roughly with this cornstarch, when you squeeze it really fast or hit it, it's like a hard material. And uh, when you when you hold it s gently, though, or if you just poke it softly, it acts like a liquid. You can kind of move your hands right through it. So you can actually pick up this mud and, uh, you know, hold it like a rock and break it in half. And then as you hold the, the pieces of it, it just starts to melt right between your fingers, which is really cool stuff. I, I don't know. I have a lot of fun with the magic mud. But the reason that this works is because the cornstarch molecules are very, very large. Now, they stick together when wet, much the same way that, for example, two pieces of paper stick together when they're wet. And so that's why when you act very abruptly with the, uh, you know, when you pick it up and you break it in half, it acts like a solid. Because all of these uh, cornstarch molecules are very much stuck together. But as soon as you let them um, act um, on their own, as soon as you don't push them very hard, the, they start to slip and slide against each other. The molecules of cornstarch, you know, the, with the little tiny molecules of water in between, slowly start to move, and it becomes almost like a liquid and just melts away in your hand. So that's a, a fun experiment. Uh, it's a bit messy, but certainly not as messy as an explosion. Um, there's no ash to clean up, just cornstarch and water. And of course, if it gets too sticky, you can just add more water to clean it up faster. Uh, oh a word well, of advice, though. A word of advice, I just don't, go ahead. don't flush this down your sink when you're done with it, unless you water it down very heavily, or you could get a very nasty clog. Oh yeah, I bet. So, that's, I was just going to say, that ash experiment, you know, <laughs> what's a bit of ash between friends, right? <laughs> oh, yes, yes. <laughs> Well, I wouldn't want uh, any of our listeners to uh, blow themselves up trying to play with acetylene. It, it is a, a dangerous chemical, and you may have access to it. I would not recommend playing with any flammable substances, and that's our that's our major warning. But we always have some fun experiments here on, on science in the studio. I do encourage you to tune in next week. I think we'll have a special review, a special press conference with NASA. Now, I don't want to give any... any any details away yet, but next week we will be announcing a press conference with NASA. We may get some special insights and answers for our Game Shout listeners. And you are, of course, tuned into Game Shout Radio. You can visit us at GameShout.com, and we'll be back right after this. This is Game Shout Radio, the number one talk game station in the world. Visit GameShout.com for more info. Game Shout. Game Shout.